The League of Beastly Dreadfuls, written by Holly Grant, pictures by Josie Pertillo. Chapter 10, A Peculiar Door. For me? Anastasia squeaked, goggling up at the gardener. He was so tall. A padlock dangled from the base of his silver coop, fastening his neck with a metal collar. As he crept forth, this padlock swung to and fro. Anastasia stared at it, nearly hypnotized with fear. We need to talk, the gardener hissed. I, I, I have uh, laryngitis. Anastasia mustered a cough worthy of her hypochondriac mom. <coughs> Maybe some other time? There might not be another time, he muttered. Don't come any closer, Anastasia yelped. Don't you dare bite me. Bite you, the gardener echoed, seizing Anastasia's shoulders and sending her heart lolloping into her throat. What did those old women tell you about me? Well, Anastasia stammered, they might have mentioned something about a, um, um, a lunatic. His fingers clenched tighter. But I'm sure they were talking about someone else, Anastasia gasped. The gardener leaned so close that the bars of his birdcage pressed painfully against her nose. You and I are going to have a little chit-chat, he whispered. But don't you dare tell them I spoke to you, or we'll both be in trouble. Let me go, Anastasia cried, wriggling her shoulders. The barber surgeon's guide plunged from her sweaty palms and crashed down to mash the tips of the gardener's authentically scuffed Victorian shoes. Ow! he hollered. My innocent toes! Anastasia wrenched out of his grasp and scrambled away into the labyrinth of corridors, galloping heck for leather until her lungs burned and her side panged and her legs juggled like jelly. Not even daring the teensiest backward glance, she vaulted a mirror bolted in the doorway to room nine and ducked inside. Anastasia flopped onto a fainting couch, breathless and woozy. She was perilously close to crying, but she blinked her tears back. Francie Dewdrop didn't boo-hoo when threatened by goons. She touched the tip of her nose and winced. What revenge, she wondered, would the gardener exact if she blabbered about the frightening exchange? Well, she wasn't going to tell anyway. Anastasia couldn't tell Prim and Prude about bumping into the gardener, and not just because he had promised trouble. If her aunties reprimanded him, the barm cakes boy might tattle that Anastasia was snooping around the asylum's forbidden wings, and that, she knew, would bring her brilliant detective work to a screeching halt. And Anastasia did not intend to stop investigating. The cushions of the fainting couch were moldy and curled up at the corners like a cheese sandwich that had been toasted too long. Anastasia spied a glimmer between them and plunged her hand into the crevice. She pulled out a petite silver bottle attached to a slender chain. Tiny script on the bottle read, Dr. Mary Mood's smelling salts. Anastasia shook it and listened closely to the pebble little rattle within, but she didn't pull out the fancy stopper. Because would-be sicky Mrs. McCrumpet had consulted every expert medic and smooth-talking quack in Mooselick, Anastasia was familiar with many pills and syrups and cure-alls. For example, she knew that waving a bottle of smelling salt beneath someone's snoot is supposed to dazzle them awake. She even remembered that Victorian ladies, whose fanciful underwear squished their lungs and left them wobbly from oxygen deprivation, bought fainting couches upon which to swoon, and dangled little bottles of smelling salts from chains that they wore at their waist. Anastasia knew something else about the small silver flask. It was Miss Custy's bottle. Victory zinged through her veins, sweet and bubbly as sarsaparilla, as she gazed upon her first major find as an aspiring detective slash veterinarian slash artist. But where were the silver clasp and the rest of its odd charms? She leapt up and flung the cushions off the sofa, then pushed her fingers into all the folds and creases. Nothing. Crawling on her hands and knees, Anastasia inspected beneath the sofa. There. Nestled among the dust bunnies, she found not a clasp, but a block of Dr. Whistlewine's Miracle Chuckle Laxative. Laxatives, in case you don't know, help you poop. She brushed the grime off the elegant paper wrapper. The Miracle Chuckle Laxative had lain under the couch for a very long time, probably a hundred years. Anastasia sighed. No matter how her stomach growled, and no matter how her sweet tooth ached, she wasn't quite desperate enough to munch chocolate laxatives. She thrust the bar back beneath the fainting couch. Then, spying a flutter out of the corner of her eye, she snatched a moth from a cobweb and snarped it down. I'm shocked too, she informed the spider whose lunch she had just stolen. Under normal circumstances, I would never eat a moth. It's creepy and weird. 
No offense. Turning away from the spider's eight-eyed glare, Anastasia noticed a curious door in the wall. The door was square and small, perhaps just large enough for an almost 11-year-old girl to climb through. And unlike most doors, it was smack dab in the middle of the wall, right where one would normally hang a painting. It was an intriguing door. It was the type of door a troll might use in a fairy tale. Anastasia stared at the door and wondered where it led. Threading the chain of the smelling salt bottle through one of her belt loops, she tromped across the parlor, opened the little door, and looked inside. Her breath whistled against her front teeth. Dumbwaiter, she whispered. Dumbwaiters are similar to miniature elevators. A dumbwaiter is a box built between the walls, and one can move it up and down by pulling on a rope. In grand old houses of bygone eras, dumbwaiters were used to hoist food from the kitchen to other stories. A servant in a ruffled cap would place, for example, a figgy pudding in the dumbwaiter, and then heave the snack up to a hungry lord or lady or duke or duchess, or in this case, criminally insane inmate, playing charades in the third story parlor. Anastasia had read about dumbwaiters in the conundrum at Mildew Manor, so she had already considered the exciting potential of such a device. Staring into the cobwebby interior of the wooden dumbwaiter before her, ideas began to sprout in her mind like moose spattered toadstools. She could zip from floor to floor without meeting her aunties or the gardener on the stairwells, and perhaps she could even haul herself into some of the sealed wings of the asylum. Anastasia suspected that in those hidden and abandoned places, she would find some sort of explanation to the asylum mysteries. Maybe the dumbwaiter would even take over room 13. <sighs> she took a deep breath and splayed her hands on the base of the rickety wooden box. What if the ancient rope snapped and sent her plummeting to the bottom of the shaft? Nudging this unpleasant thought to the back of her mind, she hoisted herself inside and closed the little fairy tale door behind her. Her arms were strong from weeks of scrubbing chamber pots and rustling weeds from the ground and doing other nasty chores but she still struggled and panted as she hauled the dumbwaiter slowly upward. The rope prickled against her hands. Finally, she saw the outline of a door, faintly traced in pale, in strangely greenish light. To her astonishment, smoke began to seep through this peculiar green seam. Was the asylum on fire? Anastasia ran to the door with her shoulder, panic swelling her tonsils. The wood moaned, but refused to budge. Crumbs! Twisting herself like a Bavarian pretzel, she placed the soles of her galoshes against the door and clicked with all of her might. The door burst open, and out tumbled Anastasia, hurdy gurdy, head over heels, nose over toes, bum over tea kettle, right into another of the asylum's mysterious. Characters.